from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Mary Lou Reeker, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the Kluge Center of the Office of Scholarly Programs of the Library of Congress to a presentation this afternoon by the former Black Mountain Institute Fellow at the Kluge Center, whose name is Daniel Brook. Daniel's new book, A History of Future Cities, is receiving rave reviews from newspapers and magazines all across the nation. Um, before we go any further, I want to make sure that you all turn off any cell phones you have so there's no interruption. This is being uh, recorded, and there will be questions at the end, but any questions you ask uh, constitute a permission on your part to uh, have those questions recorded and then streamed live from our uh, webcast. Daniel Brook writes about architecture, but architecture in the context of history. His writing has won the 2010 Winter House Award for Design Writing and Criticism and has appeared in publications such as Foreign Policy, Harper's, The Nation, and Slate. His first book was titled The Trap, Selling Out to Stay Afloat in Winter Take All America. This new book, that he's gonna tell you more about this afternoon is being praised highly by the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, and I'm sure we'll, there'll be other such praises coming out soon from other journals as well. Publishers Weekly called it, uh, the history, called the history of future cities the best new book of the week on the very week it appeared, and I want you to know also that yesterday in the Washington Post, Daniel had a um, op-ed piece that was given quite a spread, and it concerns um, getting U.S. universities to open uh, branches in poor democracies, uh, favoring that rather than the rich democracies with education. I want you please to help me welcome Daniel Brook. Thank you so much, Mary Lou. This is um, this is a real homecoming. Um, uh, the book turned out longer than I thought it was going to be. It's about 400 pages, and honestly, most of them were first drafted in this building, um, which is really strange for me because I usually write in coffee shops, and there's no other building where I've done more writing than this one. So it's kind of a really amazing moment to come back with it published. Um, that wouldn't have been possible without Mary Lou at the Kluge Center, Dr. Carolyn Brown, um, who's the head of the Kluge Center, Dr. James Billington, who's the librarian of Congress, who took a personal interest in the book, uh, way above and beyond what anyone uh, running an organization of thousands of employees and tens of thousands of patrons uh, need to do. Uh, Dr. Billington, I don't know uh, if you're not familiar, is a, well, he's, he now says he's a federal bureaucrat, but he was initially, um, he is a historian of Russian culture. Um, so he, he took a, an interest in the, in the Petersburg portions of the book. Um, C. Ford Petrus is the uh, architecture librarian here. Uh, again, he took a personal interest in the book and was uh, very helpful um, in making it come out. Amber Paranek is uh, one of the newspaper librarians uh, historic newspaper, or well, newspaper room librarians, uh, who again was in very helpful in getting me access to uh, microfilms of historic newspapers, English language newspapers from Shanghai uh, from the 1850s and 60s. Um, this is tax day, lest we forget. It's April 15th. Um, so I think it's, it's an honor to be in one of America's leading tax funded institutions. Um, I met that. Very serious. I meant that. <laughs> I meant that uh, seriously. Um, no, I, th I think, and I'll, I want to dovetail back to this at the end. But I think 
um, as we enter a century in which America will not be the certainly the unchallenged, probably not the preeminent power in the world, the, the institutions such as this, um, which project what foreign policy people call soft power, what everyone else calls culture, become ever more important. Um, if America is to have any influence on, uh, more, you know, uh, uh, influence on the world going forward, it's going to be more and more through these types of institutions and less and less through uh, military and economic institutions as in the past. So I was initially going to show a slideshow, so we have all of this set. I, f I feel bad. I made the AV people go through all this. I was going to show a slideshow and give the usual talk I give at all my presentations about the book and show you some pictures of, of the cities and uh, draw you in that way. And then I thought, this is a very weird opportunity to talk about the book in the place where I wrote it. Um, so I wanted to discuss a little bit the writing process and how the resources of the library ended up figuring into the book. Um, I guess at this point, you know, all the checks have cleared. So I can, I can just out with it. I applied for a bunch of fellowships after squandering my modest book advance traveling the world to go into all these cities. And I needed more money to write the book. And I applied for a bunch of fellowships. Um, and the one I got was one semester at the Library of Congress, one semester at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, of course, you know, in applying for a fellowship at an institution such as this, you, you're obligated to explain how the resources of the library are going to help the project. And I knew they would help the project, but mostly I thought they would help the project because I'd have a roof over my head and uh, some money coming into my bank account, and I'd sit at a computer and write the book I'd already spent a year uh, researching all over the world. Um, then once I got into the building, um, the, the magic took over. and. Uh, I did, I mean, I, did, I do a lot of reading in the reading room with Father Time there, ready to swipe his scythe. And the sense of, you know, I have one semester to mine the resources of, of this institution um, and not only draft the book, but make it a, a, the best book it can be by using these resources. And what ended up happening, and I think here it's, it's different being a, a, a trade book author, being, you know, somebody who writes books that theoretically people buy and read in their spare time and without being assigned them. Um, may be different than what a lot of uh, scholars who make up most of the people in the Kluge Center and, and probably maybe even most of the people in the library are doing. I mean, I was looking around for details from the periods I was writing about to bring them to life um, and sort of reading very widely. Um, and being in, in a certain way drawn to the obscure. Uh, the, 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 the weirder items in the library were to me more interesting because in turn I could make the book more interesting with the more obscure items. Um, so I'm gonna now just explain in a nutshell the, the book, but then I wanna go through some of the things that I dug up in this, in this amazing library that made this a much more interesting and quirky book than I could have written otherwise. Uh, so the book is called A History of Future Cities. The idea behind it is that uh, in today's world where we have instant modern cities popping up all over the place, um, Dubai is the one I write the most about because it's the most well-known. Uh, Shenzhen, China is, is another example. Shenzhen, China is younger than I am. It was founded in 1979. Now has 14 million people in it. Um, and then these sort of boom towns that have have an earlier history, but not as Boomtown. So I was recently, in January, I was in Bangalore, India, which you've all heard of, which is an amazing, right? We've all heard of Bangalore? Yeah, which is an amazing testament. I mean, this was not even a major Indian city in 1980. And now it's a major world city. Its population just surpassed the five boroughs of New York City. Um, and this was, so, so you have a, 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 a world filled with these uh, developing, or a world filled with these developing world Boomtowns. And I wanted to trace the history of them. These cosmopolitan places where you have global travel, you have a mixing of foreigners and locals, you have these fragments of the, of historically of the West drop down onto these places, um, both in terms of foreign businessmen, but even, I mean, in Bangalore, I happened upon the opening of uh, India's first Krispy Kreme donut shop. So things like this. Now this is a very, historically would be a very Mumbai thing. I mean Mumbai, in Mumbai I happened upon 
Paramount Pictures offices, which was opened in the 1930s. It's in the same building. Uh, in Mumbai, you have the Metro Cinema, built by Metro Goldwyn Mayer Corporation of the Hollywood Studio in 1939. Um, in Mumbai, you have Kodak, which no longer, I believe, went bankrupt. But you have a, I mean, you have a Kodak uh, office from, you know, as long as there's been Kodak. You have a Thomas Cook office from as long as there's been Thomas Cook. So in these, in these future cities, the cosmopolitanism is nothing new. They have, they have the longstanding tradition of uh, global architectural styles and global people all getting jumbled together in them. But what's happening now is these places are popping up everywhere. So whereas in the past, the first Krispy Kreme in India would have to be in Bombay. Now it's in Bangalore. Whereas in the past, um, a Southern California-themed gated community would have to be in Shanghai. And there are 1920s sort of American-developed Citibank and an American developer who was on the Shanghai Municipal Council built these American-style suburbs in Shanghai in the 20s. But now they're you know sub you have them in Beijing, you have them in Chengdu, you have them popping up everywhere now. So the idea is that by looking at the history of these instant modern cities, these places that used to be so odd. And you see this in the 1920s and 30s writings about them. When Westerners go to, especially Bombay and Shanghai, they say, oh, is there, oh, there's this amazing city in India. It's nothing like India. You could think you're in London. Or there's this amazing city in China. It's nothing like China. Everyone speaks English. And we have skyscrapers like New York and Chicago. And it's, see, these places that used to be interesting because they were so unusual and atypical and strange are now important because they're, they're the antecedents to this, this, uh, this sort of this, this thing that's gone global and viral and is, is happening everywhere now. Um, so most of the book goes back into these places and their history as precociously modern places or dress rehearsals for the 21st century and tells their story of how they came to be, how they came to bring all the peoples of the world together, not always on the, the nicest of terms, um, and how in turn, they created new forms of modernity for the different places they're in. So each is built as an instant modern city designed to bring the region into the modern world. St. Petersburg, younger than Boston or New York or Philadelphia, is founded in 1703 after the Tsar goes to Amsterdam and wants to bring Russia. You know, how can tiny Netherlands be richer than my giant empire? Well, if we build a, our own fake Amsterdam, maybe we can catch up. And it is given a Dutch name, St. Petersburg. It has the serfs dig the canals to make it look like Amsterdam. Eventually, the people speak French as a, a global language because they felt Russian is too uh, insular. Bombay and Shanghai are colonial projects. Bombay built as a tropical London, again, an Anglophone city. Same with Shanghai, also an Anglophone city, although it has, in addition to an American colony, which most Americans no longer know about, although the Chinese remember it, um, and a British colony that the British don't think about much because their British colony in India was so much more famous. Uh, was a, there was a French colony, but the, the lingua franca of Shanghai was pidgin English. Um, and some of this remains, uh, we have phrases that, of Shanghainese pidgin that we keep in colloquial English like no can do and chop chop. This was the sort of business language of, to make the city function uh, under Western imperialism in that day. So now I want to go through some of the, just the highlights, I guess, of some of the oddest uh, things I, I, I found in the, in the library. Um, one is part of, part of the whole idea of the book is bringing, uh, architect, using architecture as metaphor and construction as metaphor. So all of these places are physically constructed, uh, but they're also socially constructed um, sometimes in a very overt and even ham-fisted way. So you would have parties in the Russian court where they would give out a manual. They'd say, you know, this is how, this is how they have a soiree in Paris, and here are the rules, and now we will enact this. We will follow this to, the, to a T. Uh, sometimes it's more subtle. If you go to, say, a hip-hop club in Dubai, there's no manual, but everybody has seen enough of MTV to know what the rules are. Uh, to, to, to behave uh, in the proper manner. Um, so, uh, but also it's a physical construction. I did find, I'm sorry, this is kind of, you may not be able to see this, but this, I, this is on page uh, 127 of the book. This photo came out of the architecture library here. This is the uh, church of, the, of our savior on spilt blood. This is a church built in St. Petersburg atop the spot where the czar is assassinated in 1882. I believe, so we have a, some Russian historians in the 
audience nodding. Um, and it, it's the, the first overtly Russian looking building that's built in this Western looking city. Um, it's interpreted by me and before me by architecture scholars as a, an act of repentance in a, for Western culture, a, a turning back from the West. Uh, and in a bunch of uh, uh, daguerreotype plates in the architecture library, I found one uh, from the 18, around 1890 when it's under construction with the scaffolding. So I was able to have this uh, under construction, and then today, this was just taken by a friend of mine a few, you know, a year ago. Um, additionally, there was a, it's a cathedral in St. Petersburg designed by a Frenchman who, was, who had worked for Napoleon, and then when Napoleon was defeated by the Russians, decided he like went over to the Russians, um, decided they'd be better clients. And he built, um, it's actually the building whose dome the engineering of whose dome is what built the building across the street, the U.S. Capitol Dome. That was like the engineering advances in this St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg or what created that. And in the, in the library's collection, there's, um, I, I call it a coffee table book fit for the czar's coffee table. This is a very sumptuously illustrated French book because French was the, the language of this, the, the elevated language of the city at that point um, that discusses, in which he writes, you know, how he, he did his design process. And he describes it as a, the culmination of the, the Western tradition. He literally starts with, the, with you know, Greek temples and, and ancient Hebrew shrines and then moves forward. And then finally there's St. Isaac's Cathedral as the, the pinnacle of this, which is very funny because initially he wanted, he was thinking of building a Chinese style cathedral or an Indian style cathedral. He had all these sort of crazy global ideas. And the czar's like, no, 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 no. We ha it has to be the most Western looking building possible. So in, in, the, in, this, in this wonderful French book, you have him kind of hiding what the historical record shows, which is that he was much more interested in designing a, a more east, a eastern looking building than what he designed. Um, finally, there's the, uh, the guide to the ice palace. This is a real find. This is in the rare manuscripts library. Um, and this, having spent the second semester of this fellowship in Las Vegas, um, got me thinking a lot about when global cosmopolitan cities uh, rely on lowest common denominator kitsch culture which is a, it's something we all have in common. I mean, who doesn't like fire and ice, which is the theme of, of this ice palace that the uh, Tsarina decides to build. And here, the parallels, I think, to Las Vegas' indoor ski slopes and twin Chrysler buildings are, are unmistakable. Um, so she, the Tsarina decides she wants to build the world's largest ice palace in St. Petersburg. And you know, since she has absolute power, she's able to commission this. Uh, and up there, there's, there is, a, in French, um, there's a, a monograph where the scientists who constructed the ice palace, which included uh, elephants who shot, um, shot gasoline, lit, fire, lit, lit gasoline 20 feet in the air, um, and then these ice bricks that would, they would seal themselves with the, uh, in the frozen climate. They would be molded and then uh, constructed. All, all of this, this monograph is, is in the collection. Um, and it's, it's in, in, in the seriousness of, the self-seriousness of it is hilarious. I mean, it's a very funny book. It's about constructing um, the science of constructing giant elephant ice sculptures. Uh, but this is what the Tsarina wanted. And you know there's a, I mean, there is a book in Dubai or a computer file in Dubai about the science of constructing ski slopes in the desert. It's, it's uh, 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 wonderful. Um, for Shanghai, as I mentioned, there, there are historic newspapers, all of which are on microfilm, the Shanghai Daily Herald. Shanghai was, again, English language city, had an English language newspaper from the 1840s, probably almost as long as Washington, D.C. had an English language newspaper. I know in, in Bombay, the Times of India has been published longer than the New York Times, English language daily, still published every day. Um, and going through this, I, I was looking into the, the Shanghai financial crisis uh, in the 1860s, which is very much, has a lot of parallels, I think, to the Dubai financial crisis, including a sovereign debt crisis where the actual, the city may default. Um, and it had been this, this boom town. It had become the fastest growing city on earth. And then it, it collapses because of uh, internal Chinese politics. Peace breaks out in China. So all of a sudden, there's less impetus to flock to Shanghai. Um, and the, 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 the fascinating thing, I, uh, most fascinating thing I found was less the coverage than this ad um, for Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce. Um, and here's how I sort of contextualized in the book. Chinese capitalism was born in Shanghai in a similarly imitative manner as upstart Chinese businessmen began hawking bootleg copies of Western products. 
As early as 1863, the British food company Li and Perrins was taking out ads in the North China Herald to warn Shanghai consumers of, quote, spurious imitations of their celebrated Worcestershire sauce with labels closely resembling those of the genuine sauce, unquote, and threatening lawsuits against anyone who dared to manufacture or sell the knockoff product. So talk about future cities. I mean, this is what Li and Perrins, to, I bet today, has armies of lawyers in Shanghai trying to enforce their patent against spurious imitation Worcestershire sauce. And you know, when you're in, when you're in China, when you're especially in the, the hawker markets on the street, I mean, you get bootleg, you get fake everything, fake Gucci watch, you get fake Worcestershire sauce, you get, but th this is 1863. This is already, this is already an issue. Um, then with the, this was another, uh, going to Bombay, again, something we think of as today, the, uh, quintessentially uh, 21st century problem, which is Muhammad, Muhammad cartoon riots, which have broken out first in Denmark and now all over the world. Uh, I was reading a book uh, published in Bombay, English language book, um, published in the 1970s, and it, it discussed the, the harrowing 1852 Muhammad cartoon riot in Bombay, India. And it's the same thing. There was a, a Parsi-owned newspaper published um, a sort of not very flattering uh, biography of the Prophet Muhammad with a very unflattering cartoon next to it. And uh, during Friday prayers, uh, presumably a non-Muslim, not necessarily a Parsi, but possibly a Hindu or a Christian or a Jew, uh, posted the, um, the, the portrait, the, the cartoon portrait, on the, the door of the Friday Mosque, the Jama Masjid, which is still standing in Bombay. And when Friday prayers let out, Indeed, a, a riot uh, swept through the city. So I'm reading about this in my cubicle at the Kluge Center in a book from the 19, in 1975, where for the author, his name is Teresa Albuquerque, which means she's presumably go in. It doesn't, uh, go was a Portuguese colony, so there are a lot of Indians with Latino names. Um, was writing about this as some kind of strange, you know, historical, you know, wrinkle, this funny little weird Muhammad cartoon riot, and I'm reading about it in 2010, or 2000, yeah, 2011, uh, as, you know, like this Lee and Perrins ad, which is, you know, like it, 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 uh, it struck a, a chord as, as an incredibly current, um, incredibly current moment. Um, Let's see, one other uh, fascinating item was, um, and this is something that would be in very rare, um, the, honestly, the North China Herald microfilm is at Harvard's library. At, it's, it's microfilm, so it's easily reproduced. So it's at, all the top tier libraries have this. So I was fortunate that I was at this top tier library. But, but uh, this other item, I can't imagine, I, I would be shocked. It's, re it's weird that it was even in the collection. It's something most people probably wouldn't think to collect. This was a guidebook um, to Shanghai from 1903. Uh, it was self-published by the hotel. So it was the Metropole Hotel, it was a fancy hotel. So if you checked into the Metropole Hotel in 1903, I guess on your, you know, the little desk in the hotel room, there would be the Metropole Hotel Guide to Shanghai. And it had, um, it had all, all, it had ads in it. Uh, it had, you know, where's the best place to go dancing and where's the best place to get a drink and where's the, what are the sights to see. Uh, and, you know, in this 1903 book, which was brought to my cubicle, you have, the, you have this artifact of this lost world. I mean, a truly lost world. And, um, I mean, a world that's coming back now, which is part of why the, why the book, you know, why I got interested in the book and why I think the book is interesting to people. But um, this world of cosmopolitan Shanghai from the turn of the century. Um, in it, one was there was an ad for an American department store. Um, called Getz Brothers from San Francisco. And their ad, it was clearly, uh, you know, targeting American hotel guests. And it was where you can get all your American stuff in Shanghai. Um, and advertised, you know, full, we sell all American goods and manufacturers and you presumably get your Levi's jeans and your Heinz ketchup and your all of this. And of course, today there are stores just like this that cater to the new Shanghai landers who are back running businesses in the city, like my college roommate who, is just a white guy from Boston who's lived in Shanghai since he graduated and started a business there. Um, there was also a very fascinating, um, well, it's a guidebook, so a transit guide. Um, and if, you know, I'm, of course, obsessed with all things transit-oriented, but even if you're not, I think this is, 
uh, quite fascinating. They they had the, they reprinted the uh, rickshaw coolie, the, the guide to rickshaw. The rickshaw is a human pulled, uh, you know, wheelbarrow essentially, and it was it, it sort of well. I mean, Shanghai it was one of Shanghai's trademarks, and um, even to this day, I, I mean, it's a symbol of Chinese humiliation under colonial rule of Shanghai to this day. Um, but within this, and printed presumably with the complete obliviousness to the kind of horrific colonial nature of the rickshaw system uh, were the rickshaw regulations for the city, which I quote, and I, I mean, I read a lot of secondary sources on Shanghai, and I hadn't, the only place I came across this was in, the, was in this guidebook, this self-published hotel guidebook. Um, so here's, uh, this is the, the paragraph in the book. Uh, other jobs simply worked people to death. In 1934, the life expectancy for a Chinese person in Shanghai was just 27. The typical career of a Shanghai rickshaw puller lasted only four years. These are all from, that's all from secondary sources. Perversely, the official regulations from this source for rickshaw pullers in the international settlement mandated that, uh, quote, the rickshaw coolies be strong and healthy and that, quote, no old, dirty, or opium-smoking coolies be allowed to pull rickshaws. In a vicious cycle, coolies poured their strength into brief careers as a rickshaw puller only to have their livelihood taken away when they were no longer, quote, strong and healthy. And these rickshaw men who, this is again from secondary sources, these rickshaw men who so regularly expired from exhaustion on Shanghai streets, all for just 10 cents a day in earnings, didn't even own the rickshaws they pulled. At the top of an unconscionable racket of contractors and subcontractors sat a wealthy French company called Flying Star. Um, so there you, you, you have... Um, something that, you know, was never going to, something that would never be written at a lesser library, would never be written in a coffee shop. Um, and I feel like these, these little moments in the book, uh, quotes like that, having access to that is, is part of what um, brings the book to life and also gives it its sense of the time. So that, that there is a, I mean, a lot of what I'm writing about it is, imp is the ambiguous legacy of these imperial cities, and that's a politically incorrect phraseology and a politically incorrect topic, and um, I'm willing to sort of go, to go to bat there. I mean, one of the things that comes out of colonial Shanghai is um, there, it's ruled by an all-white elected by the all, you know, sort of Jim Crow-style uh, city council. Uh, but by the early 20th century, the Chinese form their own Chinese city council to run their section of the city. It's the first elected government in the history of China. Um, similarly, so the, the North China Herald, which I quote, I'm, I'm going to quote this because it's just so, just so horrific in its imperial nastiness. Um, this is after the Shanghai crash. Uh, I want to read how they, so all of the, the, the Chinese renters go back to the mainland of China because they no longer are fleeing uh, the instability. Uh, so the North China Herald, Herald sneeringly speculated that, quote, the paternal government under which they found themselves, the impossibility of doing as they liked, of being as dirty as nature intended them to be, of shouting in the streets, of forming cesspools before each door, of firing crackers and tom-toming in the middle of the night, of periodically taking the gods for an airing accompanied by fifes, gongs, drums, and clanking chains, all the absurd limitations that the municipal council assigned to the legitimate enjoyments of the Chinese must have seriously interfered with their comforts and led them to look forward anxiously to the happy day when a benign heaven would restore them to their filth, disease, and general noisomeness. So this is, so by having this source, you know, we have you have an unvarnished look at what the uh, European and American imperialists thought of the, the Chinese indigenous people. Um, at the same time, what ends up happening with this, the space created by this uh, free English language and French language press ends up creating a free, the freest Chinese language press that's ever existed in China, much freer than what exists there today in Shanghai now. Um, so this, this little this colony where the emperor had no power, uh, be becomes a place where the Chinese are able to criticize the emperor and publish their opinions in Chinese papers, um, and a place where um, Chinese entrepreneurs are, are, are taking out ads, and are, you know, there's, there's Chinese capitalism that's free from imperial constraints that supports the, the media. There's a, so there's this, this space that forms within, uh, within the colony that's actually anti-imperial in the anti 
emperor sense, but also anti uh, against the foreigners who created the, 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 the space to begin with. Um, and that's the story that the book ultimately tells, is how these cities which are built, physically built, and in, in, the, in sort of ephemeral ways, built as, as imitations of the West, um, in a kind of Frankenstein-like way, uh, go off script, and the people of the city assert themselves often, and generally in, in the cases of Bombay and Shanghai, to evict the, the imperialists who set up the, the whole structure to begin with. Um, going forward, the, what's interesting about our world today is that these cities are popping up everywhere, um, so that there, there's a relevance. There's also um, a new, a more equal exchange now between East and West because of the rise of China in particular, but uh, China and India. Um, so in, a, in, in the world I'm describing in the, in the 1800s, 1700s and 1800s, and even into the 20th century, it's very much a one-way Western architectural and cultural fragments are dropped upon non-Western cities. Um, now that's changing. I mean, I, I was just, uh, I took a few photographs of Flushing, Queens a few days ago, and there you have, uh, you have a mall that's a Chinese developer built. And I mean, it looks like a mall from China. It has the same, the, the sort of multi-level urbanism of uh, sort of, rest, of, of food stalls and then a restaurant enclosed and then shops. and and, the, and even the signage is like right out of the kind of mall you have in China. Um, so, you know, a, a century ago or a hundred years ago, the U.S. brought, we brought our skyscrapers to Shanghai. Shanghai was the only city in the world with, uh, outside, of North, outside of the Americas. South America had some too. That was a skyscraper city. Um, I mean, Shanghai had, in the 30s, had buildings taller than any building in Europe. Um, but now in this new world, we're, in this new century we're entering uh, with the rising Asia, I think some of the, the, the culture is going to flow both ways. Um, and if, if there's any, any hope for, for humanity, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to accept it. Um, and here, again, is, as I said, I just sort of come full circle. In this new world, cult, you know, American culture is going to be more, is, is the, going to be the source of, of influence and, and places like this our cultural institutions. Um, so so the, the, the hope is, is that we will enter a period of more equal exchange. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to take some questions, if that's all right. Oh, yeah, sorry, in the front here. Um, the, the, the story the, the book tells and, and the, the title, History of Future Cities and the kind of time is out of jointedness of the book plays into this. Is it, it, it begins with these very copied, often ham-fistedly copied cities and shows how they develop a style of their own. So for example, um, in Shanghai, where you started with these, I mean, the, the American colony is, is, such a, is such a sort of knockoff America that the main street's called Broadway. Um, the, the French, you know, bring the plain, the, 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 those sycamore trees from Paris and plant them in their concession so it looks like Paris. I mean, it really is, and I, that's one reason I do like showing slides, but it, it develops into much more interesting things by the 1930s. And this is after um, almost a century of, of engagement with, with the world, sort of forced engagement with the world, uh, such that you get um, uh, an architect named Dong Dayu who's trained at the University of Pennsylvania. He's Chinese from China 
trains at the University of Pennsylvania and goes back and builds a number of civic institutions for Shanghai, uh, like modern civic institutions, like a municipal library and a, a gymnasium. But he, he takes forms from the uh, Forbidden City in Beijing, the much older Chinese city, thousands of years old. Um, these forms are from the, the middle, well, in the West where the Middle Ages were much more glorious period in China at that point, uh, and puts them on top of his library. So his library has, you know, a drum tower roof. Uh, th that's one response. In, in Bombay, you get really interesting things in this period. So the, the British were building these uh, Gothic structures to impose Britishness, um, and their only real concession to the climate was they decided they would impose Southern French and Italian Gothic because um, those places were also sunny. <laughs> this is really, I mean, again, it sounds like I'm making this up, but you can't make this up. Um, but by the 1930s, you have a, a, a cohort of, of Indian-trained architects coming up, and they embrace Art Deco, which is ostensibly a European style in that it's named after the Exposition des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. That said, it's a global style. The Paris, at this, Paris has a very limited and undistinguished uh, Art Deco heritage. Uh, the, the greatest collections of Art Deco are in Miami Beach and Mumbai. Um, and there, because they have similar climates, the Art Deco is quite similar. But if you compare like a uh, Bombay Art Deco um, building to something like the Chrysler building in New York, very different climate, uh, they really do adjust to the local, they take a global style and adjust it to the local conditions. Now, then you have the Cold War and all the three historic cities peter out and there's less and less international travel. I mean, Shanghai, probably the most dramatically so, I mean, has the Cultural Revolution. I mean, China calls back all but one of its ambassadors from the entire world. Um, what had been the most open city in the history of the world under colonialism, neither passport nor visa was required to enter Shanghai. It was a completely open city, it becomes one of the world's most closed cities. Uh, admitting almost no international businessmen, almost no international tourists, um, now reopening. You know, Bombay was not as dramatic a closure and reopening, but it, there was a contraction and a, and, a, and a reopening. And then St. Petersburg, you know, its most dramatic closure was Stalin and the siege and all this. And then, you know, now it's reopening in its own Putin-esque way. Um, but, the idea that is uh, each of these cities in the 20s when there was constructivism in, Shang in, in St. Petersburg and this deco moment in Bombay and these really interesting hybrid architectures in Shanghai were much more futuristic than the cities are now. I mean, the cities are now 20 years back into reintegrating with the world and there's a lot of copying of other places. Uh, you have something called Thames Town in Shanghai. I mean, it it's looks like a Tudor town in Britain um, it has a statue of Churchill, has a statue of James Bond. Um, it's like you, you can't make it up. Uh, in, in Mumbai, you have something called Hiranandani Gardens, which is essentially Greek temples stretched into 40-story 40, 40 skyscrapers. Um, but uh, having traced the history of these cities, I, I, would, I would say this is a beginning. This is not, don't write them off. This is, we're, we're now, the year is again 1860 or 1870. I mean, we're in the very early stages of these places engaging with the world and sorting out what it means to be modern, a modern Indian, modern Chinese, and that presumably more sophisticated and interesting responses will arise. Uh, right now, the, these things are bubbling up, but it's more, it was, it was a little bit frustrating in my work, because when I was in these cities, I would talk to young, interesting architects doing interesting work, and they would get very little commissions, and they would do, you know, they would have really interesting proposals that nobody would fund, and but you know they're pushing, and I think the history gives us some hope that 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 things will uh, develop in a, in a more sort of locally uh, local way. So we we will have a we can we can have a global world without having a placeless world, and that's that's the hope. And I think that that that's shared by this this new rising generation more than the people who are uh, designing these cities today. Uh, so can we, you, sir, in the back? <laughs> That's a good, I've seen the picture of it. it I think he may be um, like a, an archetype, you know, like the ideal, the platonic form of James Bond rather than any of the individual actors. But I, I, you can, it's on the internet, of course. Yeah. Yeah.
Across the street, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So um, I, I was wondering if you could say something a little bit more about why you chose these three particular examples as opposed to some of these other uh, ones that are going through a lot of change yeah. uh, at that time. Yeah, I, want, I, I think I'll attack that backwards. It, it is important, yeah, as you point out. I mean, DC is a really great example. And the conclusion of the book um, makes the, the point that, that um, you know, America consciously sort of wrote itself into the history of the West through buildings with lots of columns all over Washington, D.C. Um, even, I mean, the Romans consciously, conscious, very consciously wrote themselves into the Greek Western tradition. By, so the, the, this is, it's, it's a less us and them, and I think it's, um, it's kind of a, it, it, the book is strange in that it starts with the, the idea that, like, we, we're going to take people's self-perception seriously. Um, so even if we, at this point, can question the whole concept of East and West or uh, see in a more sophisticated and subtle way how the West kind of creates its own mythology. Um, that f for going through the, the, the history part of the book, it really is, I think, important um, because it did feel like the West was getting dropped on, on the East to the people in the East. And that's, so I, I, um, I compare it to saying like, say I'm an atheist and I'm studying the history of medieval France just because I'm an atheist doesn't mean I can ignore the Roman Catholic Church if I'm studying the history of medieval France, even though I don't believe Christ died and rose from the dead or whatever. Like, that's still an important, even though, even if I believe that didn't happen, that's still an incredibly important factor in understanding medieval France. So I wanted to sort of go through there and then at the end kind of pivot and say, going forward, we should really kind of change our mind, our framework, because A, it's somewhat an oversimplification, and B, it just doesn't fit our world anymore. I mean, this is not the, the same kind of, relationship between uh, East, and, East and West that, that we had, you know, in the age of empire. Um, the other um, part of your question, sorry, can you refresh? The, um, it'll come right back. To, oh, well, yeah. So the, yeah, the other thing that you point out is, is correct, that there, there are sections of lots of cities, in, especially in the colonial sort of age of empire period, um, that are built often in imitation of Paris, which is, you know, the, the sort of the leading uh, cultural powerhouse in the world at that time. So you have sections of Cairo, sections of Istanbul, parts of Buenos Aires. I mean, so I, I, I didn't want to write about the New World quite consciously because I, sorting out um, what's local and foreign in a New World context is not, is, is so fraught and complicated. And I, so I, so I, I, and I also wanted to write about the purest examples I could find. So instead of, um, so, so Mumbai is more interesting than Cairo because Mumbai is built overnight in, in such a, in one fell swoop, all the modern institutions literally lined up in a row. I mean, the island, Mumbai is an island city and the island was, is man-made. Like the, the British built the island and then they built the city on it. So, yes, it was, it was a landfill, yes. It, it, was a, it was an archipelago and through land reclamation, was turned into a single island, which in, in sort of Mother Nature's revenge floods, of course, exactly where the old islands used to be. Um, but the, the, as a trade author, the, the drama of that story, of these, these places built whole from scratch, is appealing. Um, but also, uh, as I, I don't think it's just like a sort of kind of like creative decision the significance of um, a city like Mumbai in India, which you know rose, uh, or, or Shanghai in China, you know, which arose from a regional market town to become the fastest growing city in the world, is a different order of magnitude than the cities where one neighborhood was redeveloped along the lines of Paris. Uh, you have a question, sir? Um. Mm -hmm. There's still time. It's okay. I'm asking the question for So, if you address uh, these cities, and I'll take the example of Mumbai, the Mumbai which one uh, comes most readily to mind mm -hmm. uh, for these purposes. Now, you can write a sort of a history of the city from the top, mm -hmm. which is uh, from its large uh, uh, public institutions and their manifestations of architecture, uh, from um, the 
point of view of English mm -hmm. and the point of view of the English. Mm -hmm. um, but if you actually uh, choose to do it another way, and it has been done recently at least, like I don't know if you know a book which came out about a year and a half ago called Bombay Islam, no. which actually uh, writes the history of Bombay not from the English language sources, but from the sources in Urdu and mm -hmm. Gujarati and Persian. Yeah. And here, what you get is a Bombay which is not a place which is receiving from the West alone, but it's actually the place from which, for example, the Tatas financed the British campaigns in the Sudan against the Mahdi, mm -hmm. from which a good part of the settlement of the Cape Colony and the Indian laborers uh, out, from which Iranian modernism derives, from Bombay, yeah. right? uh, through, through the Aga Khan and so um, I was actually wondering whether, rather than seeing this as a situation where once in the colonial period these places were receiving, mm -hmm. now the boot is sort of on the other foot, or what mm -hmm. it is, uh, perhaps even in that period, there's something to looking at this as a process by which Bombay is not merely on the receiving end, but actually as its own domain yeah. of influence, uh, which may not be the West. Yeah, I, the West. I think th th this is um, a, a helpful a helpful question. Um, I mean, there is, and I don't, I don't read Urdu or, or Marathi, or um, there's this one source, is, as major source has been translated into English, which is Govind Narian's, he's a Goan. I don't know if, if he wrote it, I don't know what language, whether it's Portuguese or, in, I think it was in Marathi that he, that he wrote, but it, it could have even been Portuguese. Um, and that's been translated into English. And that is a very helpful source in that it, it explains, um, you know, it, it gives a non-Western perspective on what's going on. At the same time, and then there's this book, uh, um, A Joint Enterprise. I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is, was published maybe two years ago. And it, it says colonialism in, in Bombay was a, a joint enterprise between uh, indigenous elites, although in Bom the Bombay contest, the whole idea of indigenous is very complicated because it was, they were, they were islands and they, it became a metropolis and the Parsis have roots in, in Persia and Etc. But with with local with elites of this group, I think that's uh, that that's important, and that distinguishes Bombay in the book is very clearly sort of broken off as. I mean, I think the joint enterprise argument is very valid. Um, that said, I think both sides of that joint enterprise are valid. So the British, you know, the British East India Company, they're the ones who decided to build uh, a, uni a university of Bombay. Um, and it was going to be pretty, pretty minor. It wasn't going to, they weren't pulling out all the stops for that. And then uh, there's this, the, the, the uprising. And with the coming of the Raj and the coming of this new governor, Sir Bartle Frere, who has great ambitions, uh, it's not clear, it's not, he's a sort of mysterious figure, but uh, as you have in a lot of these, he just decides this is going to be the greatest city and the greatest empire in the history of the world. Um, and he decides that the University of, of Bombay is going to be a very major institution. It's going to be the equivalent of Oxford or Cambridge. He commissions a British architect from, who's done, done buildings at Oxford and Cambridge to design buildings for it. That said, who funds the buildings? The, the, the library building there, for example. The library is, is funded in part from the, from the Raj government, British government, and also in part from private donors who are um, Parsi and Jain uh, stockbrokers. Now, why is there a stock exchange in Bombay? Now that, again, there's, you can't explain why there's a stock exchange in Bombay without um, the, the British Empire and the, the British joint stock company, which was pioneered in, in Britain before it was exported to Bombay. So I, I, I want to, I think joint enterprise is the best way to look at, at, at this rather than um, sort of having to, to pick are we going top down or, or bottom up? And top and bottom are not even that. When you're talking about, you know, Jane billionaires and Parsi magnate, I mean, they're, they're, they're elites of the, in their own right. Um, that said, they're also discriminated against by the British, uh, such that, like, Jan Tata has to build the Taj Mahal Hotel because, according to the apocryphal story, he's turned away from a, a whites only hotel. In Bombay, I mean, whether or not he was literally turned away from a segregated hotel is besides the point. The, what's clear is there were hotels in Bombay where somebody like Jay Antada, who's one of the richest men in the British Empire, will not be given a room because, I mean, he's Persian-colored. 
He's tan, basically. Um, do we have a, another question? Yeah, the um, I um, I I tell that story, but I I feel like the um, the Jewish history of Shanghai that's more more important and more interesting is much less well known and plays a much bigger part in my book, which is um, this uh, Mesopotamian Jewish community uh, originally from Baghdad um, that end up. Uh, involved in, in shipping between Bombay and Shanghai, um, most notably the Sassoon family. Um, so by the time um, the, the rise of Nazism in Europe happens, um, Sir Victor Sassoon is like the scion of this family and he's, he's based in Shanghai. His uncles are in London and Bombay. Um, and he's a, a real estate magnate and he's, he's built, he builds the Cafe Hotel, which is a very important building for that period. He also has a, um, something called the Embankment Building, which is um, an office building. That's, and this is also, a lot of the Hollywood studios had their offices there in this period. This was a big market for, overseas market for Hollywood films, bigger than today when, as you may know from, it sort of got buried. There was all this coverage of whether Django Unchained would be released in China. What they, what they should mention in every article about Hollywood in China is that Hollywood permits 20 Holly, like foreign movies of, of all countries to be shown in China in screen, on screen every year, 20. So this was one of the anointed 20. So a much, more, much bigger market for Hollywood movies in the 30s, Shanghai, than it is today. Um, anyway, Sir Victor Sassoon takes em empty office space in the Embankment Building and makes it into a refugee center for uh, European Jewish refugees in that period. Um, and then the, in a kind of ironic a sort of darkly humorous twist, the, that, that uh, Austrian and German refugee community um, brings all of, like a lot of the cabaret culture that Hitler had declared decadent and depraved and, and un-German uh, to, to Shanghai. So you have this and also the coffee house culture. So all these people who you know, just had their German passports revoked and told they can't be German bring all this German culture to Shanghai in that period, which is sort of fascinating in its own right. But as I say, that, that, that's a, that's a small, interesting, admittedly fascinating wrinkle, but I feel like that, especially probably because of some, um, honestly, probably because of some bias in the American Jewish community being more based in Europe than the Middle East, um, gets like more play than it probably should. And the, the, the Baghdadi Mesopotamian community that's uh, been in the city right from the Opium Wars. I mean, that Sassoon Trading Company is there from 1842 onward is, is, I think, much more, a much more important uh, component in the city's history. I was curious about the point you made of these imposed cities providing a haven for protest against the, the, out, the, the mm -hmm. indigenous situation, and whether that seems to be going on today in any kind of way that you see. Yeah, I think, um, and here I have to be very careful because I feel like, um, well, for example, my, so my op-ed yesterday in the Washington Post argued that Western universities that are interested in opening branch campuses abroad would, do much, would, be, would much better serve their mission statements and the goal of global education to open in a poor, poor but uh, democratic city like Mumbai where people have the right and, you know, will f to, to say what they want. Um, then in a place like Shanghai, where NYU is opening, and Abu Dhabi, where NYU is opening a branch campus, or Singapore, where Yale is opening a branch campus. So I, 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 don't, I don't want any, there to be any confusion about where I stand on that. But that said, the, the book argues that these, these places that are you know, created in this very top-down manner do end up inadvertently becoming places where, all I'll say is the parameters by which the city is run are challenged. That doesn't mean 
democracy breaks out. It doesn't, I mean, St. Petersburg is a great example. I mean, St. Petersburg, the Tsar has this great idea to, to build a Western facing city and then they're all gonna speak French and then, oops, someone read the Declaration des Droits Humains, you know, the Human Rights Declaration from the French Revolution and then there are people, you know, marching down the Nevsky Prospect calling for the assassination of the Tsar and you, the, the, these things will, the, the questions will be answered, will be asked. And there will be tensions, and it doesn't. But it doesn't. It's unclear which, you know, what what wins out. And you, in the different cities, you have different, uh, you have different situations in each of them. And this is the story will continue. I mean, I don't, I don't. I, I say we should read the, the histories of these places for clues about the world we're entering in this century. But it's not a, you know, it's not a map. Um, so I end the final discussion of of contemporary Shanghai with, you know, I mean. I, the fact that I talk to a lot of um, uh, Chinese people who are educated abroad, speak fluent English, read, fluent, you know, read. They go to Hong Kong. They read the internet in Hong Kong. They go to bookstores in Hong Kong. They they get degrees in Amsterdam and London. And it, you know, the, the the way they look at China, you know, in some ways dovetails with a lot of the way Westerners look at China, and and uh, they're concerned about a lot of the same uh, lack of 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 free expression that we are. That doesn't mean they win. Um, but it does mean that you know, these global cities do breed that kind of person. If you're going to have a city, if you're going to have Shanghai today, and you're going to let people in based on whether they know English, you're going you're to concentrate the, the population that you know, is trying to read the, the New York Times till it gets jammed, or is trying to, you know, purchase back issues of the economists when they go to Hong Kong. Um, so the, the tensions will, you're, 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 the idea, that the only hubris greater than building these cities is the idea that they can be controlled. I think that's, that'll do it. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm happy to sign books in the back. Daniel Brooke. Thank you. The history of future cities. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.